The Sleeping Gypsy was painted in 1897 by the French post-impressionist Henri Rousseau. Rousseau was involved in a, a sort of a sub-movement of post-impressionism that we call primitivism, which focused on, on non-Western themes in art, expressing this, this belief in, in valuing what's more, more simple, more unsophisticated, typically doing so than using symbols of, of cultures that would have been deemed by Western standards primitive. And Gauguin's Tahiti paintings would, would be another excellent example of this. Rousseau was not a professional painter, although he had ambitions to enter the, the academy, there was, that was never really an ambition that was fully realized, and although his paintings appeared, we might say, kind of uh, simplistic or, or unsophisticated in their time, there's very important undertones of modernism here. Rousseau himself described this painting with this, this sort of caption, he said, this painting is about a wandering negress. A mandolin player lies with her jar beside her, a vase for drinking water. She's overcome by fatigue and a deep sleep, and a lion chances to pass by, picks up her scent, yet does not devour her. There's a moonlight effect, very poetic. The scene is set in a completely arid desert, and the gypsy is dressed in oriental costume. So what, what is it that makes this painting so visually appealing? This sort of feng shui yin-yang effect that Rousseau has created here between color and line congruence and in incongruence. First of all, let's talk about the terrain. We have this kind of mountainous foreground right here, and then we have this mountainous landscape in the background. So this is a good example of congruence. We're establishing some sort of a relationship between the foreground and the background of the painting, which appeals to us visually. The lion is interesting because we don't really know how to feel about the lion, do we? He sort of looks by some standards, kind of like a, like a stuffed animal, like a completely harmless stuffed animal. But we can't really see his face fully, especially the mouth. And the mouth, of course, is the most kind of dangerous part of the lion. He has this kind of menacing look in his eye, doesn't he? Kind of despite this sort of stuffed animal appearance that we might see initially. The woman herself is interesting because the position of her body suggests that she just sort of fell fast asleep from fatigue. She's holding this walking stick in her right hand, which is, you know, indicative of, of some sort of a long journey. Yet her face shows contentment. She doesn't seem to be concerned about anything. She seems to be satisfied with, with maybe the direction in which her life is heading right now. And of course, she's completely unaware of, of the lion. And looking at this painting through through maybe more of a, of a Freudian lens, we could talk about how the lion could be some sort of manifestation of, of a dream that this woman is having. And of course, Rousseau, as I said, he was very influential with uh, some of the earlier modernist painters like Cezanne, the development of Cubism, but he was also extremely influential later on after World War I for many of the Surrealists, which of course, as we already know, dreams and, and Freudian psychology played a huge role in development of Surrealism. But I think we can also talk about um, a sort of an ambiance of harmony, this this idea of the coexistence of man and animal, which is of course exemplified by the fact that we have this this lion and this woman who appear to be coexisting relatively peacefully with one another, although as I said before, we, we don't really know how to feel completely about, about the lion. We also have the this sort of perfectly circular moon. It almost looks like it has some sort of like a, a little face on it, doesn't it? Here's the eyes, here's the mouth. Reinforcing this idea of this this kind of ambiance of harmony in this completely empty desert with this, this lion gently sniffing this sleeping woman. Geometrically, the last thing I want to talk about is the pattern on the woman's dress. Okay, Rousseau described it as an oriental dress, and we see the stripes running kind of at a diagonal, like I've drawn here, and notice then how that kind of clashes with the way that the stripes are positioned on the pillow. So once again, talking about why this painting is visually appealing, this sort of yin-yang, um, opposite, uh, oppositeness or this, this kind of contrasting directions of the lines appealing to us visually and giving this painting kind of a, a, a comfortness or a familiarity because we associate patterns with it. This is kind of the idea behind gestalt psychology. That the human mind makes sense of the world by recognizing patterns like the congruence between the, the foreground and the background of the landscape, the positioning of the lines on the woman's dress and under pillow, things like that. Also, the, the construction of the painting as a whole is also logical. This area over here is pretty empty. 
right? We don't have we don't have much to see, but the painting is is shaped kind of like a funnel, right? Where the majority of the the, the objects, the woman, the lion, her mandolin, her vase for water, are positioned in this bottom right hand corner of the painting. So we kind of have this this funnel where our eye is drawn down into the right. That's supposed to be an arrow. <laughs> So moving away from the visual organization of the painting, how is this modernist? How does this have undertones of modernism? Well, as we've discussed in previous videos, the quintessential characteristic of modern art, and this was something that was um, kind of born in, in Impressionism and adopted by, uh, adopted from or inspired by the Japanese tradition of printmaking, is flatness, right? Moving away from linear and atmospheric perspective toward a, a more one-dimensional representation of the world on the canvas. And we can see that this kind of this flatness developing itself here in Rousseau's work. But what's amazing to me is that despite this flatness, he's managed to achieve such incredible texture here in the lion's mane. 